wonderful to be British. Good night. Fellow in the forces was writing a letter from somewhere in the east. Talk of a blinking feast, he said it's just like Blackpool Sands. We play with hand grenades. If we had known, we would have brought along our buckets and spades. Out in the Middle East. George was the first entertainer to join British and Commonwealth troops in the Middle East. That homely Lancashire voice became the perfect counterpoint to Churchill's drum-rolling oratory. And the troops knew that wherever Churchill went, Formby was sure to follow. He gave impromptu concerts wherever a stage could be thrown up. And where he went, Beryl went, stage managing as always. Close to the action, the famously diffident personality took on a new assertiveness he was at ease with soldiers, and he didn't sing them sentimental songs. He gave them a salty whip of home. It may be sticky, but I'll never complain. It's nice to have a nibble at it now and again. <laughs> Every day, wherever I stray, the kids all round me flock. One afternoon, the band conductor up on his stand somehow lost his bat and it flew out of his hand. So I jumped in his place and then conducted the band with me little stick of black fur on. During the war years, more than three million Allied troops were entertained by George Formby, and whether they liked it or not, by Beryl. Montgomery said, George, would you and Beryl come along when we do make the invasion? And he said, certainly. Well, eventually he did send for us, and we made the invasion into Normandy with them also. Montgomery looked at me, he said, of course, Beryl can't go. So I said, oh, yes. I said, in that case, George doesn't go either. He said, all right, then, Beryl, if you want to risk your silliness, you go ahead and do it. My best so sure that it won't fit my little brother. And my new Sunday shirt has got a perforated rudder, Mr. Woo. What shall I do? I'm feeling kind of lime as Chinese laundry blue. Now, Mr. Woo. We only did what every normal person should have done, and we did nothing wonderful, and we're very pleased to know that we were able to do it, and we'd do it again. God forbid if it ever happens. As the days emerge, we are on the verge of the most exciting news. As a single voice, let us all rejoice. Goodbye to 1940 blues. There's a B formation or the phone, and another one over Rome. The democracy can never be free till the boys come marching home. By war's end, George was a household name around the world, even in Russia, where he was voted their favorite public figure after Stalin. But George's first post-war movie was his last, for suddenly he was out of joint with the times. A new generation of film stars, aloof in their glamour, were elbowing him aside. Snobbery was back in fashion, and a more opulent kind of daydream. He was not forgotten, though. He was awarded an OBE for his services to the war effort, and the royal family, who were among his most loyal fans, invited him to perform at Windsor Castle. Queen Mary caused a stir when she insisted that George sing the uncensored version of Cleaning Windows, the number with the saucy lyric, which the BBC, in one of its periodic fits of prudery, had banned. Pajamas lying side by side, ladies' nighties I have spied. I've often seen what goes inside when I'm he took cleaning windows and a score of other best-selling songs with him on a world tour-up, organized by the resourceful Beryl. The songs and the movies had made George a legend in every corner of what was still called the Empire. In Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and South Africa, the Formies were received like royalty. The man with a talent for being ordinary had a gift that traveled well. Ordinary people 1951, and George Formby was back in the big time, at home. For the first time, he'd cracked that most difficult of nuts for a northern comic, a West End audience, as the star of Zip Goes a Million, a stage show that mixed farce and musical comedy. It was a smashing success. What extraordinary things we'll do. But six months into the run, George had a heart attack, a bad one, and had to withdraw. 
The heart condition forced George into semi-retirement, and he was never a well man again. It also made him Beryl's house prisoner. She'd been his wife, manager and protector for 30 years. Now she was becoming his jailer. On his occasional public appearances, she kept him on an invisible lead. And even a judge can go off the rails. That is, if the wife will let him. I can get me on dry right around there. <laughs> That's the one. When George made a celebrity appearance as a judge at a bathing beauty contest, this arch bit of crowning with Beryl must have been uncomfortably close to the bone. <laughs> George made tentative comebacks throughout the 50s when his health permitted. When he appeared on television with the Deep River Boys, he made a spirited attempt to accommodate the radical change in popular music. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll sing three choruses of a song that's at least 30 years old, and we'll prove that it's in the same tempo as the modern rock and roll. Let's do it, sir. And the best of luck. Can we get in the, can we get in the groove All right. first, eh? All right. A one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Now it was Beryl who was ill. Discovering she had cancer, she began to drink heavily and was soon sliding towards alcoholism. The Formby marriage, long presented to the world as a loving partnership, was in bad shape. When Beryl denied George the solace of the Roman Catholic Church, it was the last straw. George said, uh, Tom, you know, Beryl and I have finished. I couldn't believe it. It was one of those things where rather like a man say, look, uh, a blind man 